continue what we were doing last time, which was showing that how particles transform under Lorentz transformations leads to how fields transform under Lorentz transformations. And in fact, I'm going to back up a little bit and remind you of how particles transform under translations, and that shows how fields transform under rotations. The point of view here is that of Weinberg, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up certain sections of Weinberg and put them on the web page. Maybe I should be saying this when there's something that's going to be posted on the internet. Will you visit me in jail? No. Anyway, so let me review some of this stuff. We have a particle mass M spin S, and we define that state as a unitary transformation representing some standard boost on some, I think I'm going to call this K, actually. This is the fiducial vector. And K is actually just M0. And so it's the particle at rest. L of P is the standard boost, which is a rotation to the direction P hat, a boost determined by the energy, and an inverse rotation P hat. And the effect of all that is a boost. I think I'm just going to write it as boost for vector P. It's a boost in the direction P hat of an amount so that you get from being at rest to having energy P0. And remember last time, all right, the next step was if you have some Lorentz transformation lambda applied to the state P S, then we rewrote that. I'll skip a few steps here. They're in the online notes. It's the standard boost to L of P times a U of what's called W of lambda and P. K S, where W of lambda and P is L inverse of lambda P, lambda L of P. So this is the standard boost that takes you from rest to P. Lambda is the arbitrary Lorentz transformation. And then you consider the standard boost that takes you from rest to the momentum lambda P, and then take the inverse of that. So if we apply W, and if you find this confusing, don't think that you're inadequate in some way. I found this confusing, and I still find it confusing, but I found it confusing so many times that I'm now perfectly accustomed to it. Let's show what this does to the fiducial vector K representing the particle at rest. Well, it's L inverse of lambda P, lambda L of P on K. Well, L of P on K is just P. Then we have lambda, then we have L inverse of lambda P. Well, L inverse of lambda P just takes lambda P back to K. And so this thing altogether is K. So W of lambda and P just takes the fiducial vector K into K, so it must be a rotation. It leaves M0 invariant. This is called the Wigner rotation. And that means, then, that U of lambda on P and S is going to be 
Um, well, first let me say, what is U of W on P and S? Well, that's just a sum S prime with a minus J to J of some DJ S prime S of W on, uh, well, I'm, I'm putting this on the fiducial one, yeah. It is against the fiducial one, so let's just leave it there. KS. Remember, you know, this is KS, this is W, and this is uh, U. So this just um, is the rotation matrix for spin J. Not a Boot, not a Lorentz matrix, just an ordinary rotation. And then notice S prime and S are reversed. The reason for that is that if you take KS prime U of W KS, then S prime S, this will give you the, uh, this will, all right, let me just do this. This is a little bit tedious, but DJ S prime S of W, and then we have KS prime KS. So this just, oh Lord, what did I do? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm using, this should be double prime. And then this would be double prime. And so this will set, will, okay, so this sets S equal to S double prime, and this then is equal to DJ S prime, S double prime of W. Damn it, you went backwards. Oh, this is prime here, damn it. Mm -hmm. No, that's not right either. Yes, it is. No, it is. It should be yes, prime. there is a prime here. You should be mixing up the spin states. Sort of. Right, this has a prime on it. So this has a prime on it. And now we have a prime on this. And this tells us that this S prime here has to be S double prime. And so now we have that this is equal to this, which is what I want, okay? Sorry. Right. I should always look at my notes when I write on the board rather than just point it. Okay, well, then U of lambda on PS is a sum S prime to the minus J to J, DJ of W of lambda and P, S prime S, U of L of lambda P on K S prime. It's, I use P zero in the notes, and um, our notation is such that I'm following the P and S notation. U on this is then sum S prime DJ S prime S of W. And this is just uh, lambda P S prime. Okay. So U of lambda on PS is the rotation, written rotation, the state lambda P S prime. Any, any questions about that? By the way, that, let me, since this is kind of um, technical, let me just tell you a story that I heard from, I was never a student at Princeton, but um, I once had dinner with a guy who had been a graduate student uh, maybe 20 years ago at Princeton. And this was after Vigna had retired, but before he died. And, um, so he was going to teach a course exceptionally on, I don't know what it was, dense matters, something. And um, so it, there aren't that many, there aren't very many Nobel laureates in Princeton. And so the fact that Vigna, the Nobel laureate, would teach a course meant that the 
room was packed on the first day of class, and you couldn't even get into the room, let alone get a seat. The second class, you could get in the room, but you had to stand. The third class, you could actually get a seat. The fourth class, you could get a seat somewhere in the middle. The fifth class, you could get a good seat. The sixth class, you could sit almost any way you wanted. And eventually, there were only two students in the class, students who had registered and forgot to drop the class. And they sat there in terror, because what Bigner apparently would do is he'd be lecturing, and then, instead of inviting questions, he'd spin around, point to the student, and ask the student to explain the last step. Anyway, that cleared the room. Anyway, I thought that was a funny story. Okay, now, in the Peskin-Schroeder normalization, as opposed to the Weinberg normalization, this thing would look like this. 2P0, A dagger of P and S on the vacuum, equals the sum over S prime, Pj, S prime, S, W, square root of 2, lambda P0, A dagger, lambda P, S prime, 0. And so we inferred last time that U of lambda, A dagger P and S, the inverse of lambda, was square root of lambda P0 over P0, sum on S prime, plus minus J to J, Dj, S prime, S, of W of lambda P, A dagger of lambda P, S prime. So that's how the creation operator transforms. Now, since this is a representation, Dj is a representation of the rotation group, the rotation group is compact, so these matrices are finite dimensional and unitary. They're 2J plus 1 by 2J plus 1 unitary matrices. And so, if we switch to W inverse, we can make this the inverse, or equivalently, the adjoint. And then D adjoint, S prime, S, so that's D star, S, S prime, of W inverse of lambda P. So that's the equivalent way of writing this. The square root of lambda P0, 0, and then I'll just say equals 1. So those are two ways of writing it. Can you just take out the sum and call it S star? What is the star? I mean, star is complex symmetric. Okay. Okay. That's supposed to be the definition of boundary? Well, all right, let me, the first way of writing it was the square root of the energies, a sum, and it was Dj, S prime, S of W, A dagger, lambda P, S prime. It was that. And then I said, well, this thing is a unitary representation. So if I make this W inverse, I can make this the adjoint. And then, so I left it as W inverse, the adjoint. But then the S prime, S matrix element of the adjoint is the S, S prime complex boundary matrix. All right, in this form, it's a little bit easier then to say, well, what is it for the annihilation operator? And then it's just taking the adjoint of the equation. What we get is the square root of the energies. Okay. 
that, so now, uh, so, so from knowing how particles have to transform and doing this sort of Wigner mathematics, we figured out how the creation and annihilation operators transform. Now, an arbitrary mass of field will have some components which are labeled by L. And this will be the so-called positive frequency part plus the negative frequency part where psi L plus, and I'm going to write it this way, sum on S integral to QP UL of X P and S A of P and S and then psi L minus of X is going to be a sum on S integral dQp VL of X P and S a dagger P and S. Notice I haven't put in the phase factors. We're going to derive the phase factors from how the particles and the fields transform on the uh, translations. And in fact, we, we've learned several periods ago that the representation for a translation, say U of A, is E V I P dot A, and I'm using the Heston Schroeder metric. And um, so we expect that psi L plus or minus of X plus A is U of A psi plus or minus L of X, the inverse of A. Now what I'm going to do is do the same thing, but say psi L plus or minus of X is U of A psi, whoops, X, psi plus minus L of zero U inverse of X. And so in particular, for psi plus, remember we had formulas for how the annihilation creation operators behave in the translations. Um, namely, Big U, 
figure, and this is then e to the minus i x dot p a of p minus. And so that tells us, just comparing these two things, that ul of x p and s is e to the minus i x dot p ul of 0 p and s, which I'm just going to write as e to the minus i x dot p ul of p and s. So now we're just going to go to spinners that just depend on momentum and spin. If we do the same thing for psi minus, well, obviously what we have is psi l minus of x then is the sum on s integral p q p v l of x p s a dagger p and s. And that's supposed to be a sum on s integral p q p v l of 0 p and s u of x a dagger of p and s u inverse of x. And then this equation tells us we get e to the i x dot p So this gives us that this is equal to sum on s integral There's something wrong with this chart. v l of 0 p and s e to the i x dot p a dagger p and s. So this tells us that v l of x p s is e to the i x dot p v l. I'll just write it as p and s. So we've derived how the spin is transformed under x from how the annihilation creation operator is transformed under translation. But this is also something you already knew, but I think it's nice to see how it comes about. If you know how the particles transform in quantum transformations, you can figure out how the fields will transform, or at least how the fields must be constructed if you want them to transform nicely under quantum transformations. And of course we do. So now what we're going to say is we want, under a Lorentz transformation, psi l plus or minus of x the inverse of l lambda to be some sum over l prime, some representation d l l prime of the Lorentz group psi plus or minus l prime of lambda x. So this is what we want. Remember when I was talking about spin one half of left-handed and right-handed spins, this was the equation I wrote down every time. And then for the Dirac case, you put two of them together. So this is how it works for a general positive mass field arbitrary spins. Spin three halves of gravitino. And this is some representation I could call j j prime, but it would be it would mean I'd have to write parenthesis j comma j prime close parenthesis every time. So I want to skip. Okay. So this is what we want. And these notes are online. This is a couple of typos in the fix tonight. But they're all online. And so let's again, we have to separate the positive and negative frequency parts in the analysis. So let's just do psi plus l of x in the inverse of lambda. So this is going to be a sum on s integral d q p u l of p and s u of lambda a of p and s u inverse of lambda and of course u minus i p dot x which 
should have been sitting there, but I forgot to write it there. Okay, well, we know how these, how the annihilation operators transform. They transform according to this rule, square to the energy ratio times a rotation matrix for the inverse vigor rotation. And so this is equal to the sum S and S prime integral DQP UL of P and S, I might as well write it down, E minus I P dot X, square root lambda P zero over P zero, DJ S S prime of W inverse, and I'll leave out the lambda P, A of lambda P S prime. So that's what it is. And what we want it to be is this for the plus case. That is to say, we want it to be a sum on L prime D L L prime of lambda inverse psi plus L prime lambda X. That's what we want. And now, this is a sort of hard, very technical lecture. So it's a lecture where we should get a lot of questions. So this, we want this to be equal to, let me just put it up here, to be equal to sum on L prime S integral DQP UL prime, well, I wrote this somehow in a funny way, D L L prime of lambda inverse UL prime of P and S, A of P and S, E to the minus I P lambda X. So that's what we actually want. In other words, this is that. We want that to equal this, which is this. All right, now, to make use of these equations, we have to make two transformations of the, of the variables. I just have one question. Yeah. About this representations of the Lorentz transformation. Could you speak as slowly as possible, please, so I can. Yeah, so I'm just writing. What kind do you want? So the D matrices are, the D matrices you said, I think, were not supposed to be unitary because they are finite. Of a Lorentz transformation, they're in general not unitary unless the Lorentz transformation is a rotation. Okay. So these guys are not in general unitary, but these guys are because W is a rotation. Yeah, so the representation on the left-hand side of the equation, you have a unitary representation of the Lorentz group, right? This, but this is infinite dimensional. Okay, so that's the thing. So the thing is that if it is a non-compact group, you will always have unitary representations which are infinite dimensional. Yeah, at least in this, in Hilbert space, in the physical situation that we're talking about, yeah. But this goes back, I mean, if you want to, if you want the full story on this, go to Weinberg section two, chapter two, the section on symmetry. And he says, well, the symmetry is this, and then he quotes a theorem by Wigner, actually, in which Wigner said, if you have a symmetry, and in fact, well, I don't want to go off on the tangent of the equation. If you have a symmetry, then you can always represent it in Hilbert space, either by a unitary transformation acting linearly, or by an anti-unitary transformation acting anti-linearly. The anti-anti part is really only needed, as far as I know, for time reversal. All the other cases, it's linear and unitary. So basically, Wigner shows you can always represent any symmetry transformation, any transformation that we're interested in physics, by a unitary transformation. 
but it's when the group's non-compact that has to be in the Okay, now. Okay, we get a similar equation for the, uh, for psi minus. And for the psi minus equation, let me just say what it is. It's uh, sum S, S prime integral dQ P VL of P and S EDI PX square root of lambda P0 over P0 P star J S, S prime W inverse a dagger of lambda P and S prime is equal to sum L prime S integral dQ P dL L prime of lambda inverse V L prime of P and S a dagger of P and S and I should have put it ahead but anyway E to the I P lambda X alright so this is for the uh, creation operators alright now what we're going to do is in this integral, notice in this integral, we already have the annihilation operator at lambda p. So what we're going to do here is we're going to replace dqp, simply replace dqp by dq lambda p, p0 over lambda p0. In other words, we're going to substitute here we're going to say dqp is equal to dq lambda p times p0 over lambda p0. We're going to do that there. And so that gives us the equation some s s prime integral d cubed lambda p, and now because it's the p0 over lambda p0, we already have the square root, this turns into square root of p0 over lambda p0, u lambda of p and s, e to the minus i, and now this p dot x I can also write, since p dot x is the Minkowski inner product and its Lorentz invariant, we can write it as lambda p dot lambda x. So I'm going to write that as lambda p lambda x. And then dj as s prime of w inverse a of lambda p so that's what we've got on that side. And now that's equal to, or we want it to be equal to, this, which is this. But now, what are we going to do in this? In this, we've got uh, lambda x, but we have p here and p there and p there and p here. Well, you can all, P is a dummy variable, so it doesn't care what we call it. And so we can replace P by lambda P. And so in this equation, I'm just going to take that equation and replace P by lambda P, so I get sum of L prime S integral d cubed P, d cubed lambda P, d L prime L, well, just let me read it. LL prime. Yeah. DLL prime of lambda inverse. UL prime of lambda P S. A of lambda P S. E to the minus I lambda P lambda X. All right. So this is the equation that we need to satisfy if we want the fields to transform or the Lorentz transform. I have another question. Correctly. Yes. Uh, the same thing about the... Yes. 
So when you when the matrix D, so these these are irreducible representations of the uh, Lorentz group, right? The D matrices. The D's are um, yes, so representation of Lorentz groups are not necessarily unitary. Yeah, but they are irreducible. Each D is well, it depends on what, what the field is. If this field here, if this field happens to be some, you know, Rube Girl Goldberg field that has many uh, components belonging to, in other words, if it's a Dirac field, then it would be reducible. Reducible into corresponding spin sizes, right? Each yeah, if it's a Dirac thing, then it's a left-handed, right-handed. Yeah, but uh, so finally you would get some chunks of irreducible wave blocks, right? Right. Okay. Or, but it could be worse than that. The thing is completely general. But to be fair to you, uh, what we're really sort of having in mind is, let's just think about the irreducible representations. Mm -hmm. In other words, that's what, that's what, that, that, that would be the, I mean, the smart way to do this would be to think of it as an, irre, as an irreducible representation, and then we can put them together and make, re, and make yeah, reducible representations. Yeah, my problem is this. If you take a, if you take, say, if you take a simple rotation, now you, you, you have a, you, the matrix that represents it is going to be unitary, and then you can make it block diagonal, right? But these, uh, the representation that you have over here is not going to be unitary, so what guarantees that you can break it into block diagonal forms? Well... Good point. It turns out, as we'll see if we haven't already, the in fact we've, we've sort of seen it already. The 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 direct representation of the Lorentz group is a direct sum of two irreducible representations, so it's blocked diagonally, even though it's not unitary. Yeah, but it is not always guaranteed to be blocked diagonally. I mean, if it were unitary, then it would be. No, no, no. I, I think if, if anything is a direct sum. No, no, I mean, it that is, is to be dark, black diagonal. Yeah, yeah, the direct yeah. representation is a direct sum. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. What I'm trying to say is that if I give you a Lorentz group and ask you to, if I give you an arbitrary representation of the Lorentz group, and since it is not unitary, it is never guaranteed that you will have a block diagonal form once you, you know, try to break it. Let me say, um, I, I believe you can always write it in block diagonal form in terms of irreducible non-unitary representations of Lorentz group. I may be wrong, however, but I, that's my prejudice. In any event, for practical purposes, in the standard model, all we have is spin one half. Spin zero, photons and gluons and Ws. Okay. Spin, spin one, I'm sorry, spin one gauge bosons, spin one half quarks and leptons, and spin zero Higgs if the Higgs exists. Okay, that's the standard model. When you go into supersymmetric particles, you then uh, you basically still have that same ensemble, that same spectrum of, of, of fields. Then if you go to supergravity, if you go to ordinary gravity, you have a spin two object, mass plus little on the graviton. If you uh, go to supergravity, you accompany that with a spin three has gravitino, but you're still up to spin, only up to spin two. And I would guess that not until you go all, go all the way to, I guess, strings that you get arbitrary spin objects. But anyway, let's, let's, um, so in other words, it's not, that big a deal, but they are. Anyway, why don't we talk with the talk afterwards to see what the real answer to that is? But I don't think I was using block diagonal, the block diagonal yet. Yeah. Okay, so this is the equation that we've got, and the other equation for this case, that is to say, we do the same thing here. In this case, we replace dqp by dq lambda p, p0 over lambda p0. Here, we, tr we rename p lambda p. The equation we get then is sum on L prime, dl L prime of lambda inverse, dl prime of lambda p and s is square root of p0 over lambda p 
zero sum on S prime DJ star SS prime of W inverse VL PS prime. Oh, I skipped ahead one step. In other words, I'm sorry, I skipped. I skipped a step. In other words, let's look at this equation and figure out what what it means. Well, the first thing is we want to identify the operators. We want the operators to be the same. So that means we have to interchange S prime and S in this equation. So we make this an S, this an S, that an S prime, that an S prime. There. Now, the phase factor and the operator are the same. And so we can we can think of them as as orthogonal vectors in a sense. And we pull off the following. Sum on L prime DL L prime of lambda inverse U L prime of lambda P and S is square root of P zero over lambda P zero. Sum S prime U L of P and S prime D J S prime S of W inverse. OK, so this is the equation for it comes from the positive frequency part of the annihilation operators. This is the one that comes from the spinners associated with the creation operators. And you see they're basically of a similar form, namely the matrix that represents Lorentz transformation on the spinner is equal to this ratio of energies and then times either a DJ star or a DJ on the spinner or the spinner for the annihilation or the creation operators. OK, so is there a question? So you you got this by comparing the equation you were deriving to the one you wanted to get to. Yeah, the actual derivation is of this. I mean, I just quoted this from my notes. This one comes from this equation. In other words, we we say, well, the coefficient of A of lambda P and S and E to the minus I lambda P lambda X in the two coefficients have to be the same. And so that tells you then that this is a U that gives you this equation. Or to put it differently, if this equation is satisfied, you plug it into the integral and it works. So you don't even need to do this business about orthogonal vectors. It's what I was thinking of. You don't really need it. All right. Now, this D of lambda inverse is just begging to be multiplied by a D of lambda. You'll get an identity and you get the following rule. And I'm going to have funny primes here, but I'm just copying it from what's in my notes. Oh, you didn't get a candy, right? Who asked the question? Any particular prime? That doesn't matter. Huh? That doesn't matter. So you basically got to let me answer this. This is fine. Don't worry. That's good. Yeah. I'll ask the same question. Well, I guess it's almost the same thing. So you said you took the form that you wanted to get. I mean, where did we get this original form? You said this is what we want and this is what we have. Where did we get what we want? Let's review what we're doing. It's so long and technical. We want the field to transform into the Lorentz transformations according to a decent Lorentz transformation. Why don't we get the inverse there? Can we derive that somehow? I mean, if I was to say what I wanted, I would not want the inverse. I wouldn't have either. But in retrospect, 
that's the one. <laughs> in other words, in hindsight, that's what you need. Okay. A great question. <laughs> Good. Okay. All right. So, um, that's what we want. We know how the annihilation operators and the creation operators transform the Lorentz transformations. So we implement the Lorentz transformation. And what we get is this. And we want it to be that. And we know that that is this. And so then, identifying those two, we got these two after we change dqp to dq lambda p times that, and after we trend, we rename p in this equation, and then we see that we can satisfy this equation if we just have this uh, result, this relation. And now I'm going to multiply this relation by d of lambda from both sides, on both sides. And what you get then is square root p zero over lambda p zero sum f prime l p l double prime l of lambda p j s prime s of w inverse of lambda p u l of p s prime. So that's what you get. Um, in other words, you multiply by this d of lambda. It makes this. It makes this the identity. Pulls out a u, and then you have a d over here, and you just have to keep the indices straight. The analogous equation for the spinner associated with the creation operator: the same square root sum s prime l. D L double prime L of lambda DJ star S S prime W inverse D L D S prime. So those are the two equations. Notice it's S S prime in this case and S prime and S in that case. Alright. Okay, are we sort of happy or does somebody else either have a question or a long of chalk? It's okay to ask questions even if you just want the chalk. But you can't ask just what kind of chalk. It has to be a question that explains something. So I'm sort of always worried about um, and I don't want to be candid. I'm sort of always worried about which operators are acting on which spaces, and uh, so which ones can commute and not commute and stuff. So can we talk about the, the phase here? I mean, this phase is really an operator. Yeah, yeah. Anticipation. What? E to the IP dot X. Right. I mean, this is an operator on Hilbert space, right? Here? Yeah. Well, it was in the sense when P was the momentum operator. But here, just P is the, in other words, we came from over here. The translation operator U of A, which has the momentum operator in it, capital P, on A of P and S. P here is just labels which momentum. Okay, so it's just a number. Right, and so this is just a number. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Great question. You should go on the Yes. <laughs> I keep reminding me every time I think about it. Reminded of Andy. Play God, uh, in which some Greek characters, all the Greek characters, are named after the same as one of the diabetes. It's part of this production and folks go there. So you were going to ask something? Yes. So when we constructed this W, the argument was that since it leaves K invariant, it has to be a rotation. Yes. But don't. And time reversal also oh, okay. Um, good question. Uh, yeah, parity certainly 
Time reversal, it's so spooky. I don't even want to think about time reversal. But well, I mean, let's just think about it. I mean, it is whatever it is, okay? So it's a standard boost. All right, and let us say here that this Lorenz transformation, I mean, you're quite right. This Lorenz transformation could have involved parity. Let's say he said that we're inside the proper orthogonous Lorenz group. All right, so we don't bring parity into it. But if we did bring parity into it, it's not that bad, because it would just mean that D had to be a representation of O3 rather than SO3. Okay? In other words, D could be, W could be a parity reflection. It would then be represented by an O3 operator, O3 matrix rather than an SO3 matrix. All right, that's interesting. So depending on whether it's proper orthogonous or just orthogonous or what, let's keep it orthogonous at least. So this W could be a rotation that's actually a reflection. All right, anyway, so there we are. These are the equations that we want. And now in order to figure out what they mean, we're going to make, we're going to go to special cases rather than the most general possible thing. So the first thing we're going to do is set P equal to K, which is just M0. So P is going to be this, so these are going to be then on the right, finished particles at rest. And we're going to say that lambda is the standard boost that takes us to full momentum Q. Okay, so then W of lambda and P is L inverse of lambda P, lambda L of P. This thing is, well, what is L of P? Well, P is just K. L of K is just the identity. So this is just the identity. And then lambda, we said, was L of Q. And this is L of inverse of, well, lambda P is just Q. Or just L of, lambda P, no, I'm sorry, lambda P is just Q. Lambda is L of Q. P is just K. So lambda K is just L of Q, K, which is Q. Because L of Q takes you to Q, the standard boost. So this thing here is just the identity. It's L inverse of Q times L of Q. So the Wigner matrix goes away. It's just the identity. Or possibly a reflection. So this guy is just the identity matrix. And we then have rather interesting formulas. U, and I'll cut down on the primes, U L of Q and S, because then lambda P is Q, is now square root of M over Q0. D L prime L of L of Q. U L of, and I'll say K S. Well, if we can use three momentum here. If we use three momentum, this thing is just zero. And similarly, V L prime of Q and S is square root of M over Q0. D L prime L of L of Q. V L of zero and S. Okay, so these are our formulas that tell us what the spinners are. What they have, well, they don't completely tell us what they are, but they tell us what they have to satisfy if the fields are transformed properly under the Lorentz transformation. So 
So the particular rotation being just the identity is a consequence that we started with. Well, we made, we wanted to simplify this whole thing. But it's a consequence of starting with P being the special K. Yeah, the particle of rest. And L being lambda of Q. So the special boost for K is just the identity. It doesn't do K, because it starts with K and goes to K. All right. All right. Well, now we've got these things. Now we can sort of figure out what they are. And in particular, this is going to be related to the homework. So I'm going to make homework related to this. By the way, one of the reasons why I'm doing this is I look in Peskin, and I don't know, my impression of Peskin's writing is that he just takes these equations and sort of splashes them onto the page. Doesn't care whether they're right or wrong, whether they're infinities or things of meaning, whether they're anything follows from anything else. Actually, one of my colleagues here who since is emeritus, Byron Peabody, was a slack and did stick his head in the beam when it was on. Fortunately, he didn't leave his head in too long. Electrons, I guess. Or jet or something. I'm not quite sure what it's called. He's a very nice guy. Quite athletic. All right. Well, let's see what this means in a case that's actually important to us, namely spin one half. So L of P, remember, is this standard boost is R of P hat, B of P zero, R inverse of P hat. And so this is effectively B, a boost in the P hat direction, in the P hat direction that takes us from K to P. And this is evidently E to the alpha as a Lorentz matrix, four by four now. In fact, that's what L of P is, really is a four by four. This is P hat dot B. Remember we had these, oh boy, this is bad notation. B here is boost. This is the triplet of boost matrices, the four by four boost matrices. And alpha is some number. In fact, this is the, so if we want L of P, if we want L of P to take the vector one, zero, zero, one, into the vector, whoops, M, zero, 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 into the vector P zero, P, then this is one of the homework problems. I haven't put it on the web yet. But you guys know the notation CH for cosh? And SH for cinch? I think this is a very nice notation. I mean, why put in all these extra letters? This is a common notation in some books that have been translated from the Russian. The reason is that Russians, the Russian language has letters for CH and SH. And so when the guy translated, had to replace one letter, he said, well, this is sh. And so it's SH. That must be what I'll make it. And the other one is ch. That must be CH. And he just couldn't bring himself or herself to go to cosh and cinch. Anyway, I think this is a very nice notation. Anyway, what I want you to show is that CH is that, and SH of alpha is length of P over M. And so if this is L of P, 
that D one-half zero of LT is going to be E to the minus I alpha P hat dot K, whereas in this, where in this representation, K is minus I sigma over two. And so this D one-half zero of L of P is E to the minus alpha P hat dot sigma over two. And as another homework problem, I want you to show that this is CH of alpha over two minus P hat dot sigma SH of alpha over two. And then there are half angle formulas for partial cinch. And I want you to use them to show that CH of alpha over two is the square root of P zero plus M over two M and the SH of alpha over two is square root of P zero minus M over two M. And what that means then is that this matrix here is square root of P zero plus M over two M minus P hat dot sigma square root of P zero minus M over two M. And you can rewrite this as P zero plus M minus P dot sigma over the square root of two M P zero plus M. Similarly, and I'm not sure whether I'm making this homework problem or not, for D zero one half of L of P, well, it's obvious that you just, you know, you remember that for when we go from one half zero to zero one half, we just change the sign of this. And so that means that this is just P zero plus M plus P dot sigma over the square root of two M P zero plus M. So now we have the representations for the standard boosts. And now we then can relate the spinners for left and right handed fields for spin one half, massive spin one half particles to whatever we take the spinners to be at zero, they're just given by these expressions, these two by two matrices. And in fact, if you put them together to make a direct uh, four component field, whether a Meyer runner or a Grant, Um, then what you get is the D, I'll just write it as Dirac of L of P is M plus P slash M zero over the square root of two M P zero plus M. Okay, where P slash is gamma A piece of A. It totally is gamma zero P zero minus gamma A. And this what this looks like is it's one over the square root of two M P zero plus M, and then it has this nice block diagonal form, P zero plus M minus P dot sigma zero zero P zero plus M plus P dot sigma. So this is what the standard boost looks like. Okay. Now you might think that we can just pick for U zero two orthogonal four vectors in the direct case or in the in more of the Myronic case, or you can just make this two orthogonal uh, uh, 
component vectors and vectors, at least in the four component cases, a little more. Let me, let me, let's see how much time. Yeah, we have enough time. All right, let me just show what you, what, what we do to close in on the, close in on what these spinners, there's a constraint actually on the spinners at zero momentum. These spin, these at rest spinners. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to these equations, these two equations. We're again going to set P equal to K or the particle at rest. But now we're going to set lambda equal to a rotation. So let's see what happens in that case. Well now it's W of R and as I said, P is just K. So this is L inverse of R on K. R, well L of K is just the identity, so that's the identity. L inverse, what is R of K? Well R of K is just K. L inverse of K, well that's just the identity also. So this is just R. So the Vigna, the Vigna rotation for when lambda is a rotation and P is just the fiducial vector representing the particle at rest M zero, that's, that's just a rotation. So those two equations over there then turn into these. U sub L prime of zero in S is sum S prime L DL prime L of R DJ S prime S of R inverse UL of zero S prime and V L prime of zero in S sum S prime L. So obviously these indices L and L prime should be interchanged to make this a little bit more reasonable. But anyway, L prime L of R DJ star S S prime R inverse VL of zero S prime. All right, well, what we can do now is we can multiply the top equation actually by DJ of R and that will turn this into a chronic delta. Any questions? So when you do that, what you get, and I'll do this in detail, UL prime zero S DJ S S double prime of R equals now a sum of S S prime and L DL prime L of R. Now notice this DL prime L of R is the representation for the Lorentz transformation that's actually a rotation. And so that one should be used. Anyway, DJ S prime S of R inverse DJ of R S S double prime UL of zero S prime. And I've got my indices straight. It's S prime L D 
L prime L R. And so this just gives us delta S prime S double prime U L of zero S prime. And so this is sum on L, D L prime L R, D L of zero S double prime. So now we've got then a funny sort of thing here. The spinner at rest acted upon by, from the right, by a standard rotation matrix, unitary, is the rotation matrix for the Lorentz, from the Lorentz representation, the Lorentz group times the spinner at rest. And, okay, that's it. Let me just refer to Weinberg for the other one. I didn't write it down in my notes. Okay, it's, sum then S prime, V L prime of zero, S prime, D J star, S prime S of R, is sum L, D L prime L of R, V L of zero S. Okay, that would be the other one. There should be a sum on the left-hand side of the first one, right? Yeah. Okay. S even minus G. Okay. So now, what you can do, well, we're over time. What you can do is figure out constraints on the spinners at rest from these equations. But since we're over time, I'm not going to do it. Are there any, anybody else need to draw one? So, let's see, the greater you get. I don't, thank you. Okay, so let's.